Hey everybody, welcome to the Daily Space Weather. I'm your host Dan, aka smash mash We're starting things out looking at the sun. 94 angstroms. From the SDO, it's a 48 hour video. You can see sunspot 2767 in the foreground. And in the upper left, sunspot 2768. They're both fairly small sunspots at this point. Uh, they're both alpha class. And they're both from cycle 25. More in-depth information on that momentarily. And next we're looking at specifically Sunspot 2767. I'll show you the latest state of affairs with that. Let me hit loop on that so you can see the last day of activity. Again, it's an alpha class sunspot. Uh, there is no opposite polarity umbra, just one polarity umbra there seen in the front. We don't see any coronal mass ejections or anything like that today. And our regular viewers are well aware that we'd be covering it if there was one, <laughs> regardless of what other YouTube channels NOAA and NASA would have to say about it. Let's look at the fields. I'll just press refresh there. Here's the latest fields. And there you can see not a lot of field complexity really with uh, either of those sunspots. There could be some trailing opposite polarity umbrae building in these areas of sunspot 2767. And by the end of the video, it could be completely different. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. And when we say eye on, how well the pun is intentional. A bunch of uh, filamentary activity associated with Sunspot 2768 also. And here's a close-up of some of that, along with a great Earth-scale image. Great indication of how the plasma is flowing there while looking at it through the emission spectra of ionized helium. Great view there of Sunspot 2768. It hasn't produced any significant flaring. We don't see any sort of B-class flares or anything like that. Here's the view in 171 angstroms. Just a fantastic close-up there. You can see how uh, the area around the sunspot is kind of concave. Just a great view of that rising sunspot and a bunch of filamentary activity as well. We'll let it play through one more time as it's such a great view there. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux, which we cover every day, is now up to 72. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> as we come off of the solar minimum, by the way, a solar minimum not as minimal as the minimum between 23 and 24. Solar cycles 23 and 24, the minimum in between there, was actually deeper than the one we've just experienced. No matter what other YouTube channels and other idiots on the internet may tell you about it, there's countless data points proving me correct. KP index is at 1. There's the X-ray flux, and you can see no B-class flares, although it has come up here, and that's no surprise as we see two sunspots visible from Earth at the same time. Proton flux, still flatlined, no major coronal mass ejection strikes, so no surprises there. Looking at the real-time solar wind to see a recently shifty phi angle, BTBZ is very uneventful. Total field is at 3, actually at 2. BZ components at 1, so nothing too exciting there. A pretty equal and baseline poloidal pull from solar magnetism. Phi angle at around 274 degrees. And we just saw an uptick here in solar wind density. Could be a weak incoming coronal hole wind stream. That would be my best guess as we see the solar wind density come up and the velocity precipitously drop off at the same time. So solar wind density around 9.5 protons per cubic centimeter, solar wind speed 325 kilometers a second. Next geospace magnetosphere movies, here's the pressure, and that's four hours of data. We see a fairly symmetrical pressure here, both on the bow shock side of things, which is on the left, 
and the magneto tail sort of things, which is on the right. Nothing to write home about there. And you can look at this to guess what the solar wind would be. You'd usually be correct if you understand the way the data relates. Next, looking at ground magnetic perturbations, and we see actually some significant perturbations here, despite not a whole lot of solar magnetism or induction caused by incoming protons. Check that out. That's chiefly magnetic there. And this probably has to do with snapping back and forth between the north and south pole current sheet polarities. We'll show you what we mean later. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Anyway, there's four hours of data on that during this polar excursion. And welcome once again to another Smash Lights segment. The kind of segment where I'll talk about whatever I want, whether it's political or tech-based or whatever, we're going to cover it. Here's an article on SciTech Daily using a network of gravimeters to search for dark matter hidden inside the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> hey folks, there might be weakly interacting massive particles, otherwise known as wimps, hidden inside the earth. Oh my god, there's a pink elephant in there. What a joke. Almost as silly as LIGO. What do they think they're measuring? I don't really know. Anyway, the article's on SciTech Daily. If you need a laugh, go have a read of that. Let's talk about some real information. The transient X-ray outbursts from Sagittarius A star, the core of the Milky Way galaxy. Here are the data reported from the Neil Gorel Swift Bat X-ray Observatory. And we see we've actually had some quite significant upticks here in the X-ray output of Sagittarius A star. A very dense series of transients there happening. And there has been a slight uptick here in Sagittarius A star's output over the past I don't want to say the wrong number. Over the past, uh, oh geez, over the past uh, nine years, although we also do see low transients during that time as well. Let's take a look at the crab pulsar. And here are the x-ray transients from the crab pulsar. And it is sort of right in its baseline mode here around 0 0.2. Well, you can see that's pretty normal. And let's lastly, let's look at Cygnus X3. Pardon the delay. There we go. And there is Cygnus X3, otherwise known as the tail of the swan Deneb. Part of the summer triangle, visible all year long in the northern hemisphere. And during the summer, it never sets. It just circles Polaris. And it's coming back off of an active state once again, dropping back down to a more quiescent state. You can see the baseline is now around 0 0.02. And you can see right there, that is more of a quiescent state. So it's been in a sort of an indecisive state here over the past several months. And we monitor that regularly as it is one of the only, if not the only, known point source for cosmic rays. If you want to follow transients yourself, check out the Neil Gorel Swift Observatory. And when you want to search for stuff, just uh, type in that, uh, hit Control F, and then hit type in Vela, for instance, and you'll find the Vela Pulsar. And just click on that, and there are the transients from Vela Pulsar, another very consistent X-ray source, probably also like Crab, used to calibrate X-ray telescopes. Talk about high energy space observatory detecting a fast radio burst from a quote dead star which brings up the fact that we've never seen a star die or a star born and many astronomers arrogantly suggest that we have it's a pretty well-known fact nowadays that stars have been known to wink out and turn back on and so this has caused a little bit of confusion with Magnetar SGR 1935 plus 2154, a, quote, stellar remnant, which I'll just refer to as a massive radio source.
and for some reason it produced a whole bunch of radio waves. Now this is a feature that should not happen with a quote dead star or a quote stellar remnant because these are not things that exist. We've never seen a star die or get born. Face the facts, deal with it. And a star can stop emitting light. We're not going to get into the cosmology of it today as it's a daily space weather video. But we've never seen a burst of radio waves resembling a fast radio burst from a magnetar before. Now, our viewers may not be surprised by this. I'm certainly not surprised by this. As I am aware of how radio waves are generated. And anyway, this part of the electromagnetic spectrum is way down at the, at the left side there the low energy photons in the form of radio waves. And fast radio bursts are an important part of current astronomy, cosmology, etc. Perhaps have a read. It's another SciTech Daily article. And I don't know what I've clicked on here, but the most complete 3D map of the universe I'm not concerned with. Now, if you may have noticed recently, smashamash.org has been redirecting you to this site now. And it's looking a little differently here. We've only got a couple of links on the home page, and Smash staff will be working once again today to uh, get this set up the way we want. So one of the links here is to the Smash store, and the other one is to smashomash.com slash forum. Please check out smashomash.com slash forum if you haven't yet. And thanks to all of our new members over there, we're now up to 1,345 users, so very nice, very nice. And thanks everybody who's posting things, such as Be Stoic. And we hope everything's doing well for you, Be Stoic. Sounded like things are looking up yesterday, and we're stoked about it for you. Now, quick little reference to super ionized water, the ultimate black ice. Turns out that when you compress water down to millions of atmospheres, it turns into a very strange sub substance. The oxygen moves into a lattice structure like this, where each atom of oxygen is just suspended here at distance from the other oxygen molecules. And the liquid metallic hydrogen just kind of flows around in here, making for a very odd superconducting black colored material known as super ionized water. If you're not familiar with it, it probably explains lots of the cosmology of things like gas giants. And uh, uh, some astronomers are actually starting to believe the fact that perhaps planets like Neptune and Uranus may have super ionized water in their cores or someplace down in their mantles, which explains things like their extremely powerful geomagnetic fields. Now, of course, I would blame condensed matter for basically explaining all of cosmology, but we won't get into it today. Just understand that condensed matter physics is the way forward with astrophysics, physics, cosmology, and geophysics, because it also explains the generation of Earth's geomagnetic field and things like electron availability from Earth and from stars. Now, we are streaming live to Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash smashomash. We've only got 46 subs over there. And if you want to see the content live as it comes out, these daily space weather videos are typically always streamed live to Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash smashomash. For all of you on YouTube, please don't forget to press like and subscribe. Visit the links below the video and try to help support the channel if possible. And check out our links as well. Now, there are some on here. We're also on BitChute. We've just reached 200 subscribers, and for you BitChute viewers, expect a BitChute exclusive coming soon. We're very excited about the extreme success over at BitChute, where we receive hundreds more views per day than we do on YouTube. Were you aware there was an asteroid the size of a car, which just zipped by Earth in a close flyby? And when I say close, I'm not talking about in lunar distances. I'm talking about measured in miles. This thing was as close as some satellites. Let's see here. It was traveling at a speed of only 27,700 miles per hour, which isn't really that fast for, for an asteroid. And it's only three meters. Um, it passed within the orbit of satellites in the geostationary ring. So that's an incredibly close flyby. 
Sunspot 2020 OI4. Got as close as 25,000 miles from the Earth. And it's so close, they're not even going to list it in lunar distances because, well, that's a very, very low number of lunar distances. That story is on space.com. By the way, thanks to our patrons, we've now got nine different uh, tiers for our patrons. Originally, we only had the intro tier and the gold member, and now we've got all the way up to the condensed matter squared tier, as well as intro squared, intro cubed, the elemental tier, the spirit tier, the elemental plus tier, intro to the seventh power, 70, 99 of the gold tier, etc. Thanks to our patrons for being the true source of funding for the content, as we make about two cents per hour via Google AdSense making these videos, as we are buried in search algorithms. I think Google thinks that we're right wing because that is how pathetic and idiotic the algorithms of Google are. Very similar to Facebook in how censored you'll be based on untrue expectations of your political stance. We're also on Subscribestar. Please visit the other links also below the videos. Let's talk about fraud. Oh, yeah. Florida man used PPP loans to buy Lamborghini Huracan and goes on spending spree, staying in luxury Miami resorts. What is this all about? Well, it's about the government bailouts. As the government bailouts benefited the rich in massive ways, people like hedge fund managers who didn't need any of the money, decided to cash in anyway. Isn't that great? So as you're, as the poorest people have your money inflated, the richest people are buying Lambos and heading to luxury resorts in Miami. And this is the kind of fraud that happens at the government level and at the corporate level because of corporate welfare. Yes, that's right. Here's another article on Zero Hedge about currency debasement which is what's causing your inflation. And by the way, I'll be asking for a raise probably today at my job. And uh, the reason I put it in quotes is because I'm what you call essential personnel. And what I do is I'm part of the administrative department for a food safety testing company. And we receive about half of our samples through shipping and the other half of the samples through pickups. So our couriers are the only people who drive all around and go to our clients. We're typically the only people that ever meet our clients. Anyway, this year's raise request proposal will include 10% simply for inflation. So the rest of my raise will be just on top of the 10%. We're expecting inflation to be at least 10% as a result of so much money printing. If you weren't aware, there are no fractional reserve requirements anymore in U.S. banking, which means banks can loan out an unlimited amount of money. Money is no longer even printed. It's just zeros on a computer screen, folks. And this is what has caused gold to be at a historic valuation in comparison to the dollar. Now, two years ago or so, I would have told you that the dollar has been reduced in value by 97% since 1913 when the Federal Reserve Act was signed into law on December 23rd by Woodrow Wilson. However, now it's certainly much, much worse than that. We're expecting at least 10% inflation rate year over year. And so if you're asking for a raise, if you want an actual raise, an 11% raise amounts to a 1% raise due to what's going to happen to the purchasing power of your dollars. And by the way, inflation is a hidden tax that hurts the poor and the elderly much worse than anybody else. So the dollar's being debased, and while it's not being debased as bad as other currencies, because check it out, the dollar's going up versus other currencies. But look what it's doing versus gold. That's because other currencies are worse, but the U.S. currency is also bad. So U.S. sovereignty and the U.S. stock market is has not evaporated yet. However, the value of the dollars is evaporating. So watch those precious metals. They're not made in China. Let's talk about China. Have you learned how to say China? you got to say it at the top of your face. Now, Broadway actors, singers, they're, they're taught to project their voice from the bottom of their pelvis. When you say chede, you want to say it at the top of your face. Chede, as if you have a, a sinus infection. Perhaps sinus infections, are they made in chede? 
well, I don't know. Let's talk about Joe Biden's brain. Uh, it seems to be barely functional. It's made in China. And this is why his VP pick will be so important. Here's some notes on Kamala Harris. Do not hold grudges. I don't know what the rest says. It looks like a bunch of chicken scratch. Here's an article on USA Today about Joe Biden's notes revealing talking points about Kamala Harris. The other points were campaigned with me and Jill. I guess he couldn't remember that. Talented. I guess he couldn't remember that. Great help to campaign. Great respect for her. Wow, Joe. I think your memory might be playing an issue with your ability to be president. Just saying. And uh, by the way, if you're going to pick Kamala Harris, well done. Nobody likes Kamala Harris. And uh, if you're surprised that a bunch of Bernie bros are burning down buildings right now, they warned this would happen if Bernie <laughs> did not get the Democratic nomination. So it's completely insane. And um, th this, this VP pick is not going to get Joe elected. Nothing is going to get Joe elected. And uh, personally, I feel terribly for Joe Biden. He should be retired long ago. Let's talk about fraud and big tech. Have you noticed some problems with commerce? Well, were you aware that companies like Amazon, Google, and Facebook are helping with fraud? intellectual capital theft, and counterfeiting? Well, <laughs> it's true, folks. It's true. So here's a story about some expensive shoes. And it's also on Zero Hedge. It's zerohedge.com. The, the brand Rothy has been hijacked. And Facebook is not going to do anything about it. So in any case, there are all kinds of fraud all over the internet. Be careful of what you buy. Um, if you see a, an offer that's too good to be true, it probably is. And I'll tell you what's not too good to be true. Those shirts, they're not made in China. And uh, we do have all that to offer now. You've got four different products. So you've got, first of all, you've got Smasher Price, my first pandemic. The t-shirts are $24.99 plus shipping, and you'll save on shipping for additional units. It also advertises smashamash.org. You can also get the I've survived a global pandemic so far Grim Reaper design with the giant planetary sized coronavirus covering up everything that you do here at the Smasho store. So you've got the first release was the, the black shirt. Then we've got multiple colored shirts, leggings, and the I survived shirt. So there are the leggings. They actually come in purple and gold and black. So secure yourself a pair of those if you like. Those are $44.99 plus shipping. And there's the I Survived a Global Pandemic So Far shirt. Also comes in gold and purple. Why? Because those are my current cycling team colors. The Smash Up shirt color comes in purple, orange, gold, red, lime green, and pink. If you need to reach me for a breaking news story or just to send me a photograph, if you'd like something featured on the channel, just send me a text or give me a call at country code plus one, area code 610-936-9799. That's country code one, area code 610-936-9799. And thanks for tuning in to another episode of Smash Lights during this Daily Space Weather Smash-O stream. And let's move on to some other things. All right. Ghost magnetometers are all over the place. And really, there's only one magnetometer. It's the GOES-16. GOES-15 has been offline for ages. And uh, I believe the GOES-16 is going to be the only one. they got to get rid of this S. And you see these spiky moments here in the, in the magnetometer like this. And usually you'll see a smooth noontime midnight. Noontime midnight. Uh, but you don't see that smooth thing because we're doing repeated transitions between the North and South Pole current sheets, I believe. And here you can see what's going on with that. It has to do with Sunspot 2767 and Sunspot 2768. And I believe 
let me just bring up the last image here. So here's the last image. And you see this area of dense plasma. When the Earth's field line snaps around that, we might be right back in the South Pole current sheet because that's going to be ruled more by Sunspot 2768 than Sunspot 2767. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Next, looking at the line of sight field plot, which shows you the B field, which is the one in which you live in blue. Also, the interplanetary magnetic field. And you don't see this being pulled up yet towards Sunspot 2768, which is actually surprising a little bit. However, that sunspot is pretty small and pretty weak, despite being accompanied by a large plage. There's the one-year graph of electron flux, and we're back to more normal levels with that. Here's a three-day graph of electron flux, and we didn't quite reach warning levels yesterday. And I don't expect to see them today. Again, as we see a ramp up of the solar wind density, we'll probably see the density come down and the solar wind speed go up. Let's look at a map of the entire air column in terms of electrons. Here's the total electron content forecast. And we don't see any significant anomalies here, I don't think. Looking pretty normal with minor nighttime charge ups over the South Pacific. Next, we're going to look at just one layer, just the ionosphere. And here are six hours of data on that. It's looking a little bit wobbly on the sun side, but nothing to write home about. There's the last image, that one coming in at 845 UT, and it's looking quite normal. Let's look at where things are in the solar system, moving a little bit out from home. Please leave a comment if you're viewing from a different solar system, galaxy, universe, timeline, multiverse, spacecraft, solar system, stellar system, whatever. Anyway, here's where things are now. Here's where things will be in one week, I believe one day after the next full moon. If you're up before dawn, you should be able to see a wonderful Venus, very high, very bright. It's on the Instagram page, instagram.com slash smashamash. If you're an Instagram user and you haven't checked us out there, please do so. We do see an uptick in earthquakes here. Uh, quite a lot of, I'll say, medium-sized quakes around the world, including some deep ones, such as this 4.4 at Afghanistan. It's at nearly 200 kilometers depth, followed only about 30 minutes later by a 4.2. Right near the same location, that one's at 204 kilometers depth and a 4.2 magnitude. We did see a 6-plus magnitude quake in the Aleutian Island chain. And I believe that was the largest of the past 24. And we're just scrolling up the list here to show everybody all the quakes of the past 24 hours. From when we did the stream, here's a 4.8 at Fiji. It's at extreme depth, 541 kilometers. Here's a deep quake in Central America, uh, in, in southern Mexico. It's a 4.4 at 145 kilometers. Here's another deep quake, also at Mexico, right in the same location. Could be the predecessor to a larger quake at the surface. Anyway, if you're in an earthquake-prone zone, please have a plan. Have a bug-out bag. Know which buildings may collapse. Let's add that little area. Places such as this could experience a large quake, and we really do have a very low number of large earthquakes. It's basically an earthquake drought, folks. Coming in only five minutes later in Japan, so we see a deep quake there in Mexico, and then a deep quake in Japan at a 4.1 magnitude and 373 kilometers depth. So it's a legit deep earthquake event, lots of deep quakes. Here's a 4.6 at Guam. And let's move on to look at volcanoes. Karimsky's exploding. That's on the Kamchatka Peninsula. And it's producing a 12,000 foot tall plume of ash. That's 12,000 feet above sea level. Flight level 100 at Abiko. Nishinoshima exploding. 12,000 foot ash plume there. Dekono 
Flight level 070 as it produces continuous volcanic ash emissions. Fuego, Strombolian er er eruptions, explosions, producing a 16,000 foot plume of ash there. And we still see incandescence observed in the crater. Revenador exploding, flight level 150 there. Sabancaya exploding, flight level 210 there. Please do not attempt to pole vault the caldera. Here's weather.gov's map, current warnings and so on. And we do have a tropical system moving up into the Caribbean, as reported here by AccuWeather. Here's a snippet. The tropics with potential tropical cyclone 9. This area here in the Atlantic. So we've got a potential cyclone. And there is the warning track. Shout out to Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff, leave us a comment and give us a shout out. As Peter Schiff knows that solar activity has to do with economics. Turns out that a plunge in incoming sunlight may have triggered snowball earths. Who would have guessed? Well, lots of people would have guessed. Now, they don't know what caused the incoming plun uh, the, the plunge in un incoming sunlight, although it does cite one important fact, the positive feedback mechanism of the albedo effect. That's right. What happens is it starts to snow, and when the planet gets shiny enough, it starts to snow more and more and more, and the whole planet glaciates. Now, here on Earth, we've seen historic amounts of snow in the Northern Hemisphere for three winters in a row. So 2017 to 2018, 2018 to 2019, and 2019 to 2020 all experienced two standard deviations above normal snowfall. This is how a glaciation actually happens, folks. And for all those folks who are worried about melting glaciers, head to globalcryosphereWatch.org. I, I don't know. Go look at the snowfall totals. There is a positive feedback mechanism for snow. When it snows, the planet gets shinier, more energy gets reflected back into space, and you can get a longer and longer winter and a shorter and shorter growing season. It's very bad for your health. And again, we have no idea what could have caused this. It could have been solar activity or a lack thereof. It could have been cosmic ray flux causing the whole planet to cloud up. We really don't know. Anyway, the article's on phys.org in the Earth section. Looks like a non article and uh, no more comments on that. One of the things that could cause a snowball Earth would be cosmic rays. So let's take a look at some cosmic ray monitors. Here's Apatite and Barentsburg. Apatite down over the past 30 days, as well as Barentsburg. Next, Athens, Greece. And please bear with me while these load. We are streaming live. And we see a slight downtick there at Athens, as well as some anomalous looking data. Keep in mind, Athens is much farther south than Apatite and Barentsburg. Next, Mexico City. Slightly down on the past 30 days there as well. And this is a great one because you, you can access archive data. Yet another source which will inform you that cosmic ray flux around 2008 and 2009 was actually significantly higher than it is now. So for all those YouTube channels suggesting that we're at the modern maximum for cosmic ray flux, sorry, it's the maximum since 2015. In other words, they're exaggerating information so that you'll fund them. Next, looking at Olu. And you can see Olu is slightly down also over the past 30 days. Here's DOMC Antarctica. Pretty flat in the past 30 days there. And DOMB Antarctica still not sending data during this Antarctic and winter. If you want to follow the stuff yourself, look up Network of Cosmic Ray Stations, links to cosmic ray data. Don't take our word for it. Look up the data yourself if you don't believe me. But don't worry, folks. I won't be lying to you. Next, looking at the pressure maps here on windy.com, we're going to advance this via the GFS forecast. We'll let this move into tomorrow around noon my time, and thanks for everybody tuning in. We, we're located here in the Lehigh Valley, and the operation consists of Christy, my live-in girlfriend, known as Smash Staff, and me. Dan, a.k.a. smash -a -mash. There's where pressure cells are expected to be. Tomorrow at noon my time in Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Just trying to take control of my, of my PC back here. Windy.com has a great mobile app. And nullschool.net has a great 
desktop app. Here are the jet stream as reported the jet streams as reported by nullschool.net. And we see extreme oddities here over the Indian Ocean with the jet with the jet streams flowing east to west, which is far from normal. Here are the jet streams of the western world. Moving on to some more weather stuff. Here are water vapor maps for Europe and Africa. Water vapor maps for the Far East and Oceania. And thanks again to our international viewers. Please leave us a comment if you've never done before, especially if you live in some odd location, such as the Far East. Not that it's odd, it's just that we don't have any viewers there. And lots of lightning striking right now. We're on lightningmaps.org, my favorite spot. When I hear thunder, blitzortung.org is really the parent of lightningmaps.org. It's a German outfit. And the most concentrated storms in the U.S. right now are in South Dakota. Hey, Fort Thompson. There's thunder rolling in. I want to visit South Dakota. It sounds amazing. I'll bet there's some killer bike riding up there. Anyway, next time you hear thunder, convince your foes that you're Thor by forecasting the thunder. Yeah, you can forecast thunder, folks. It's for real. And here we can see this potential tropical storm moving toward Puerto Rico and Dominica. The island containing Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Yes, there's two countries on Dominica. I'm sorry, the island of Hispaniola contains Haiti and the country of Dominica. They call it Dominica. We call it the Dominican Republic. I wish everybody called their countries the same thing to reduce confusion and language barriers. Here is the U.S. Doppler radar map. And we see some, some storms here across various parts of the U.S., the most concentrated being there in central South Dakota. By the way, I like to, when I'm looking for clouds and it's dark, I like to use the NASA GOES interactive weather satellites. Band 7, 3.9 nanometer shortwave infrared. Here is the U.S. water vapor map. And we're actually going to look at the convergence over my head right now. As sometimes I'm actually interested in my own weather. And we've got a cool down in the forecast here. Following today's probable heat wave. We've got a northeasterly flow there pulling a bunch of hot air up into Pennsylvania. And let's take another look here at... South Dakota, to give any viewers in that area an idea of where the storms are intended to track, expected to track, rather. And it's going to stagnate a little bit here as we've got some dry, massive air providing a sort of a wall and some compression provided by this dry air moving to the northeast. As dry, massive air really controls the weather, folks, the Doppler radar map is only showing you movement in the air column. The water vapor map shows you the real story as the water vapor, even the water vapor not condensed onto clouds, can't hide from the water vapor satellite. The real inputs to the weather are the dry, massive air. And if you're wondering why dry air is more massive, it's because of atmospheric nitrogen versus water vapor. Significantly more massive is the nitrogen, so that by the percentage that water vapor exists in the atmosphere, that is less massive. So cold, dry air, more massive. Moist, hot air, less massive. Your bike goes faster on a hot, humid day, believe it or not. Thanks, Smash Team, for tuning in. Remember to share on your social media if you don't mind. Um, we've got a lot of things to do this year, and we are entirely behind. Please consider funding us. Yes, financially funding us. I suck at asking for money. I'm going to start getting better because I see no alternative and I would remind you to not try to vanish like me, because uh, I'm adept. Anyway, thanks for flying, American Smashways. Please don't forget to keep your head and arms inside the Smash Plane at all times, because we've got bonus features. Yes, we're going to show you the 193 Angstrom's 48-hour view. We're going to show you the Intensity Gram, the latest update of it when we made the video. Here's a close-up of Sunspot 2767, and it's actually degraded since I started doing the video. 
There are some potential umbrae here, but they've shrunk in the past hour. So we don't expect that to turn into a beta class. Sunspot 2768, also not expected to turn into beta class. We don't see any trailing umbra there. Just this umbra, and that is of North Pole polarity. Here's the latest colorized magnetogram. We do have another active region here as well. Doesn't look even close to a sunspot yet. And there you can see that small little possible umbra. If that stays in place for 12 hours or more, it may be classified as a beta class sunspot, but I doubt it again because it's shrinking. Here's the current state of affairs with 2768. And we do see a massive plage behind that. A massive plage. So only one umbra, but still lots of activity. And there's a huge filament back there as well. Here's the 193 Angstrom's 48-hour SDO video. Corona hole rotating in there in front of Sunspot 2768. Again, thanks for tuning in. Remember, stare at the sun, don't drink, and if you do, don't drive. Welcome to the Neo Renaissance. Visit our links. Buy some clothes. And since it'll never be now again, may that solar wind be at your back. And that Covidiously absent from your multiverse.